today, um, well, last time we saw what a derivative was, and we computed some the derivative of some functions using the definition. As it turns out, um, that can be quite annoying. Yeah. Is it okay if I leave that to my So. I just threw it on the like leave and then it'll be That's fine. <laughs> so, uh, we compare the derivatives of some functions using the definition. We're going to actually compute this limit. Uh, requires a lot of algebra, and sometimes it can get quite annoying. So, for example, when we're finding um, the derivative of x squared, we had to actually expand x plus h all squared. You can imagine if we had to find x to the tenth, we'd have to expand that. It gets annoying pretty quickly, even for a simple function like x to the tenth. Um, so what we want to do now is we're going to derive some rules and formulas that allow us to get to derivatives easier. So that's the that's the goal of today. We're going to learn some derivative rules and formulas to compute derivatives quicker, more efficiently. Um, so we're going to derive these rules. So um, today's class might feel like a bit of a whirlwind, but it will be catch catch what you can get. Uh, but even if you don't, just make sure whatever I put in a box, that's what you need to remember. Don't remember. Don't get anything else. It's fine. I would look over it. I would try to get it. It will make you a better math student if you can read and digest all of it. But if you, if not, just get what's in the box. That's going to be important. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to derive some derivative rules and formulas. Uh, let's begin uh, with a fun fact, which we're going to use. I don't know if I can call it a fun fact. But here's the fact. A and B greater than 1. Hey, pay attention. A and B greater than 1, it turns out, perhaps quite curiously, that log of base, log to the base A of B, you can actually take the inverse of such a thing to get another log if you actually swap the base and the thing being logged, it turns out. Quite interesting. Um, but it's actually going to be useful for what we're doing today. Here is how you can prove it. So let's set log to the base a of b equals to c. We know that actually means that a to the c is equal to b by our first log rule. Um, now I want to determine what this looks like in terms of log to the base b. So I'm going to just take log to the base b of both sides. What's log to the base b of b? One. One. Um, there's a log rule that says we can take the power here, bring it down in front. So this implies we have c log to the base b of a. And so I can now solve for c by just dividing by log to the base b of a. We're not taking log of 1 at any point because these are bigger than 1, so we don't have to worry about division by 0 or anything like that. And so you can see. C is equal to log to the base A of B, but it's also equal to 1 over log to the base B of A. So you can actually swap the base and the thing being logged, and it's equivalent to taking a reciprocal of the first log. Okay. So that's very convenient. Okay. Why is that convenient? Well, we're going to see pretty much uh, right now. Our first goal, we want to figure out what is the derivative of an exponential function. So if you have a function that looks like 2 to the x, 3 to the x, pi to the x, e to the x, remember that's the important one. We want to know what would the derivative of such a function look like. So we'll start with the definition. By plugging in that into the formula limit as h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x equals over h, as if that will give us that guy. We know that constants can be factored outside of limits, and if the limit is dealing with the h, that means I can think of an x as a constant as far as the limit is concerned. So there's a common term of a to the x that I can factor out here. And I'd be left with 
that limit. Okay. So the derivative of a to the x is going to look like a to the x times whatever that limit is. So now we have to figure out what that limit is. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do a change of variable. Set n equals to this guy, a to the h minus 1. So I want to just replace this with a single variable. Hopefully it's going to simplify things a little bit. There's a thought process that went behind this, but for now we can just know. We're going to do a change of variable. With that change of variable, I can start to solve for the h. And so I can take here log to the base a of both sides. And that will give me h over here. You can also note that as h approaches 0, your n will approach what number? If your n is a to the h minus 1, if h gets close to 0, what does that expression get close to? It also gets close to 0. So, in other words, I can now reimagine this limit as the following. This ends up being equal to, well, the a to the x is still here. Now I'm going to change the variable from h to n. So as h approaches 0, it's the same as n approaching 0. The numerator is now n. The denominator is now log to the base a of n plus 1. And so now I have to compute that. So let's continue. So what I'm going to do first I'm going to bring this n into the denominator it is approaching 0 so I'm going to assume that it's not currently 0 and so I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as n approaches 0 of 1 over 1 over n There is a log rule that says I can take this guy and move it up to the power. A couple classes ago I mentioned to you that a property of continuous functions that we can pass limits through them. So that's what I'm going to do. I can take this limit and move it past the log and move it inside the log. So the limit of log of something is just the log of the limit of that thing. Right? Log can apply to both top and bottom, that's a log rule. Log of, as n approaches 0 of 1 is just going to be 1. Limit of the bottom, that's the limit rule. Uh, limit of the bottom, I can pass the limit through the log to end up with this side. Anything look familiar here? What's this guy? That's E. That's one of our definitions for E. Somehow that pops up. Hmm, convenient. Turns out that this is 1 over log to the base A of E. Curiously enough. Now, I can rewrite 1 over log to the base A of E. Well, what can I rewrite that as? Well, using a fun fact. Yeah, the natural log of A. Right, natural log of A. In other words, the rule says I can just take a reciprocal and switch these two. We know log to the base E is just another way to say ln. So we will get A to the X ln A. That leads us to this rule. The derivative of a to the x is a to the x ln e. First thing in a box. You need to know that. So for example, if I have to differentiate 2 to the x, well, that's 2 to the x ln 2. 
differentiate um, 5 to the x, that's going to be 5 to the x ln 5. Uh, it could ask you to differentiate pi to the x, that's going to be pi to the x ln pi, etc. It doesn't matter what the constant is, that is how you can differentiate it. Derivative of a to the x is going to be a to the x ln a. Of course, technically, we, we assumed here that your a is bigger than 1. But of course, if your a is smaller than 1, we know we can write that as a reciprocal. And we can deal with that afterwards. Now, what we can do here is to come up with a special relationship we know that the natural exponential uh, is very important to us. So if we set A equals E, you'll notice something nice coming out. Because this will tell you that the derivative of E to the x is going to be E to the x times ln of E. And what's ln of E? Yeah, one. that's just 1. In other words, this fact gives us a nice corollary. Corollary is just a mathematical fact that you can extrapolate from a previous mathematical fact with minimal work. We call that a corollary, and the corollary is the following. The derivative of the natural exponential function is the natural exponential function. That already sets e to the x apart from almost any other function that we can uh, talk about. In fact, there is literally only one other function in all of existence for which the, such a statement is true, where its derivative is itself, and that is the zero function, right? Which for mo most of the time is very uninteresting. No one's going to be studying the zero function very much, right? But we know the derivative of zero is zero because zero is a constant. As for a non-constant function, e to the x or a constant times e to the x is the only kind, other kind of function whose derivative will be itself. So that already sets e to the x apart from any other function we would know besides the zero function itself. So in the existence of all that is function, only two classes of functions are their own derivative, the zero function and the natural exponential. And that one's a lot more interesting. So already we start to see why this function is special. Uh, but let's continue here. Last time we looked at the chain rule. So pretty much any derivative rule I give you in a basic form, we'll be able to rewrite this rule in a more general form using the chain rule. The chain rule says, well, we know how to differentiate e to the x. But what if someone were to plug in another function? say e to some other random function that's not x. The chain rule allows us to deal with that. Right? So according to the chain rule, these two would be true. So let's say I have an exponential raised to some random function versus e raised to some random function. So u is some function of x, or can be considered some function of x. Right? So it doesn't have to be x itself, some other combination of operations that gives you some function. Okay, so it turns out, you might remember what the chain rule says, hopefully you do. The chain rule says, if you want to differentiate something where there's a function plugged inside of it, first you differentiate the outer function. The rule to differentiate the outer function here will be a to the u ln a. And then you multiply by the derivative of the inner function. So we simply multiply by u prime. And this is a generalization of the first rule that I gave you here. In a similar way, if you want to differentiate the natural exponential, differentiating the outer function is going to be e to the u. And because of the chain rule, if that's something other than just x, you have to multiply by its derivative. So to differentiate e raised to any function, its derivative will be the derivative of the power times the original function. 
that being said, if for some reason your memory real estate is running out, which it's not going to be, um, I would rather you memorize the chain <coughs> rule versions of any rule than just any rule itself. So let's put a double asterisk beside these facts. So, so far we've covered four rules, but if you only want to memorize two of them, I would choose these two to memorize because they're a lot more general and they actually cover the previous cases. You will notice if I let u equals x, then your u prime will just be 1 and you'll get this rule back. Right? So, memorizing these is automatically memorizing the previous ones. So, if you have to memorize, if you want to cut down your memorization a little bit, um, that's how you do it. Um, but these are very important rules to know. So, for example, if I ask you, what is the derivative of 2 raised to the x squared? So that can be a problem. The answer will be the original function times ln of the base times the derivative of the power. We saw that the derivative of x squared previously is 2x. And so that will actually be the derivative here. Or, or if I ask you, what is the derivative of e to the square root of x, for example? Okay. So all I would do here is uh, to apply the chain rule. It will leave the original function times the derivative of the power. What was the derivative of radical x? Okay. One half x to the negative one half, or one over two radical x. So that's how you find that. Just take the derivative of the power times the original function for e to any power. If you have some other base to a power, it's the derivative of the power times the original function times ln of the base. So you have to attach this part if your base is not e. So now we already know how to, we know how to find the derivative of relatively complicated functions without having to go through the entire limit definition. You can just know that's the rule for these functions. So that's how we differentiate exponentials. Let's talk about another important function. How would you differentiate a logarithm? Let's start by differentiating the natural logarithm. What I would do is I would set y equals ln x. Now ultimately we want to find y prime, right? The derivative of y. Now, I don't know how to differentiate ln x yet, however, we know that we can rewrite a log equation as an exponential equation, and I know how to differentiate exponentials, so that's what I would do. This means that if I take e raised to the power y, I would get x by applying a log rule. And now what I want to do, this is equal to that. If these two functions are the same, then their slopes will be the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate both sides. What is the derivative of e to the y? Yeah. E to the y times y prime. E to the y times y prime. Literally put y here, y here, y here. So this is y prime e to the y. What is the derivative of x? One. So now, y prime is what I care about. Let's solve for y prime. Um, it's multiplied by an exponential. I can just divide by the exponential. It's not going to be 0, so that's fine. So here I get 1 over e to the y. So you might ask, what is e to the y? Well, e to the y is x. That's just 1 over x. Okay. 
derivative of the natural log is 1 over x. Of course, by the chain rule, we can generalize this a little bit. We can say the derivative of ln of some random function that is perhaps not just x. Well, how would you differentiate that? Differentiate the outer function, which is going to be 1 over u, and multiply by the derivative of the inner function, which is going to be u prime, whatever that derivative is. And so we can actually write this as, we usually just multiply this across, and we can think of this as u prime over u. So if you want to differentiate the natural log of some function, you take the derivative of that function, and then you divide by the function itself. That is the chain rule version. I probably really memorized that one if you have to memorize only one of these two. Quick examples of finding this here. If I wanted to find the derivative of ln of x squared plus x plus 1, well, I would put what's inside the log underneath. And on top, I would put the derivative of that. Derivative of x squared, we know is 2x. Derivative of x, we know is 1. Derivative of 1, we know is 0. And so that is the answer. That is the derivative of that function. Here's something I would that's going to come in use later. By later, I mean in a few minutes. Uh, what about something like this? The derivative. Let's write this a little higher. The derivative of ln of the absolute value function. Now this is useful because we know that for an L, the domain of the log function is for the inputs, they have to be strictly greater than zero. Sometimes we might want to consider what if my x can be negative. Um, and so when I, when I put the absolute value, literally the only number that is off limits to this function is the number zero itself. But I can plug in both positive and negatives into this. Now let's look at what the derivative would look like. I could, knowing what absolute value means, I can just branch this off. This is going to be the derivative of ln of x. If your x is positive, it will be the derivative of ln of minus x if your x is negative. Taking these one at a time, Derivative of ln x, well, we know what that is. That is 1 over x. So it's 1 over x is if your x is positive. Now, what's the derivative of ln of minus x? Well, we can apply the chain rule version of this rule. That's going to be 1 over minus x times the derivative of minus x, which is minus 1. The negatives would cancel. You realize that that would give you 1 over x again if your x is negative. So in other words, this is just 1 over x. And that will work for all x not equal 0. <coughs> so the derivative of the log of an abs of absolute value of x is just 1 over x. So these are two important rules to remember. Um, this is just a rule I, I'm telling you to because I want to use it. I guess that's fun fact two. Let us continue. 
polynomials are a very important class of functions. Uh, we want to know how to differentiate them. Um, also, power, general power functions of x are important. So now, an important question is, how would you differentiate something that looks like this? x raised to some power. Very ubiquitous function in a calculus sequence. Let's actually figure out what that is. So here n is a constant. And we may assume that x is not equal to 0. In the event your x equals 0, that's just the derivative of 0. You just apply the constant factor, the constant derivative rule. So x to the n, as long as the base is not 0. Let's see how we would take care of that guy. I am going to do the same thing that I did with the logarithm. Set y equals x to the n. And now I know I just want to find y prime. Now, the power is the thing that makes this complicated, right? If the power is 1,000, it's really annoying. If the power is like radical 2, then what the heck does that mean, right? So I'm going to want to get rid of this power in order to apply the rule more simply. And how can I get rid of a power? Use a logarithm, that's kind of what they're for, right? So if I have something with some powers that I don't want to have to worry about, logarithms is how I get out of that situation. However, remember, I can only log things if, this, if they're positive, which means if an x is negative, that's going to be an issue. So what I can do first is just take the absolute value of both sides. And the absolute value of x to the n is just the absolute value of x raised to the n. We have that value, the absolute value rules, because we don't. You know, the absolute value of multiplication is just that. Right? So by applying that here, we can factor out the power of n. Okay. So we can start here. So that will ensure that our x, whether I plug in a positive or a negative value, that this quantity here is going to be positive. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is let's ln both sides. And now we can do that. That will allow me on the right side to take this power, move it down removing its power. Okay, that one probably didn't work very well. Okay. So this means that this will be the case. Oh, and there's our guy here, the absolute value of x. What I'm going to do now is differentiate both sides. I already know how to do that guy. What's the derivative of this guy? No. Yeah? Y prime over y. Y prime over y. You'd have to apply the chain rule because this is not just x. So you get 1 over y by that rule, but you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. So this side would give you y prime over y. This side is going to give you, well, the derivative of by the constant factor rule, you leave the constant alone. Differentiating this is just 1 over x. So we just get on this side n over x. Now we want y prime, so I just solve for y prime at this point by multiplying both sides by y. But what is y? Well, y was x to the n. Now I apply laws of exponents. That's going to go into that n minus 1 times. And so this would be n x to the n minus 1. <coughs> so this rule tells us how to differentiate x raised to a power. We call it the power rule. That's how, that's how math people name things. So it's a very important rule. It's called the power rule. 
So whenever you hear someone mention that, normally this is what they're talking about. There's a power rule for integrals, but usually people say the power rule for integrals. Whenever someone just says the power rule, they're talking about this guy. It is the rule that says the derivative x raised to a constant power is nx to n minus 1. And it's in a box, meaning you need to remember. So, one of the most basic rules there are for derivatives. It turns out it's kind of a little bit sketchy to prove this if you don't have exponentials and logarithms under control. And so what happens in a typical calculus textbook is they start out with this guy and they basically say, well, we can't prove the entire thing now, so we're going to prove special cases. And they end up have rolling out this proof over several sections. Okay, let's do in this case. What about this case? What about this case? And then finally, they deal with this for the general proof. Um, however, I just decided it'll flow better if we just dealt with exponentials and logarithms first, and then we can give a lot of things will come to us very easily that otherwise a calculus textbook would have no choice but to kind of haphazardly step around the issues. Um, but yeah, once we actually know how to deal with exponentials and logarithms, a lot of things come easy. So. So in your textbook, if you were trying to follow along, you might have realized that they actually don't do the exponentials first. That's just something that I do, because everything comes easy after that. So, mm -hmm. so that's the power rule. So at the end of the day, this basically tells us if you have x raised to any power, like x to the 5, how would you find the derivative of that one? Um. Take the 5, bring it down, then subtract 1 from the power. So that would give you 5 x to the 4. Or I can ask you about what is the derivative of x to the 1,000. Well, that's going to be 1,000 x to the 999. Imagine trying to expand that and use the limit definition be there the entire test, and maybe even later. And it's worth mentioning that we can even look at a lot of the familiar things that we've already looked at. So for example, the derivative of 1, we did that already. We know that's actually uh, 0. Or you can even think of the derivative of c in general. The thing is, you can actually think of this as c x to the zero power, and then applying that, you get c times zero times x to the minus one, which is zero. So from the power rule, you can derive that the derivative of a constant is zero. You can also derive that the derivative of x is just the derivative of x to the one, the first power, and then that just means you put the one down, one minus one, that's one times x to the zero, that's just 1. The derivative of x is 1. We could also derive easier than we did last time the derivative of x squared. We can talk about the derivative of x squared. Well, that's just 2x to the 2 minus 1. 2x, right? just like a one-liner. We can even talk about the radical x. Right? Well, that's just the derivative of x to the 1 half power. Well, by this rule, I can move the half down in front, subtract 1 from the power. That gives me 1 half x to the minus 1 half, which is 1 over 2 radical x. That becomes easy. We can look at the derivative again. And you can even look in your notes how long it took us to derive all this stuff. But now, with the power rule, I can think of this as x to the minus 1. Applying this rule, negative comes down in front. Subtract 1 from the power, get minus x to the minus 2. So, this is a very powerful rule, and you can see it'll save you from a lot of uh, heartache. That's the power rule.
far we just did an entire class in what two minutes just now once we had the power rule. This took us the entire class last time. Okay. That is the power of these rules. Yeah, that didn't matter. Okay. Uh, let's talk about some other rules. Um, I mentioned that derivatives do not distribute across products. So if you wanted to find the derivative of one function times another function, here's what that would look like. And again, for one, it's easy to see why just taking the derivative of each part and multiplying them together does not work. I mean, you can take, for example, derivative of x squared. We know the answer is 2x, right? That's, that's the answer. Okay, cool. However, we could have written x squared as just x times x. Right? That's valid. If I, if I were to think erroneously that the derivative would just apply across the product, well, that would give me, well, derivative of x is 1, derivative of x is 1. If I multiply, the, if I take the product of the derivatives, I would get the answer 1. This is clearly not the right answer. Right? So clearly, derivatives do not distribute across products. Right? So we can see that from very simple examples. So now the question is, how would you differentiate a product? If you don't know how to do something, well, you go back to the definition. So that's what we're going to do. This is going to be the limit as h approaches 0. Now all we have to do is figure out what that limit would look like. So this is one of the cases where math people get a little sneaky. One of many cases. Probably why people don't trust their math teacher, I guess. Are you sure you're not going to ask us that on the test? If they ask that like a thousand times, don't trust them. Because we do things like this. What we're going to do here, the trick is to subtract and add something convenient. And it turns out I can subtract f of x and v of x plus h, and add f of x times v of x plus h. I'm adding 0, so I'm not changing anything. And for a second, you might wonder, what is this guy up to? <coughs> but then, you start to see the genius of this move we will actually break this fraction into two parts. Because we know that's how fractions work. We can do that. So we're going to go ahead and break the fraction into two parts. This will be the limit as h approaches 0 of, in the first fraction, notice that g of x plus h is actually a common term. I can factor that out. Let's put that at the back. Factor of the g of x plus h plus, notice in this term, your f of x is a common factor. I can factor that out. Just put that one at the front. And we end up with g of x plus h minus g of x over h. Now we know by the limit laws, the limit of a sum is just the sum of the limits. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. So I can literally take this limit and apply it to each of these individual functions. And the more perceptive among you would realize that if I apply the limit here, I will get f prime. And if I apply the limit here, I will get g prime. Applying, letting h go to 0 here will just leave me with g of x. So ultimately, this becomes f prime times g of x plus f of x times g prime of x. This is how we would differentiate a product of functions. It is called the product rule. 
Yeah, I think the derivative is the only thing that is named in a non-intuitive way. <laughs> it's so special. This rule tells us how to differentiate products. What do we call it? Product rule? So that's the product rule. Let's actually just state that. It's called a product rule. It says the derivative of a product of functions is the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. We'll talk about a generalization of this rule next time. But right now, this is something you know. It's called the product. Yes. So over there in the first step, are we applying the limit first or putting h equal to zero? Well, applying the limit is letting okay. h approach zero. It but the limit will distribute to here, then to here. And to here, because <coughs> we had limit means that the limits distribute across products and they distribute across sums. They distribute across both. So if I take the limit as h approaches zero of this, that is the derivative by definition. Limit as h approaches zero of this, well, I'm plugging in h equals zero everywhere. And then this is just itself because there is no h. This is the derivative of g by definition. So now you might say, what about divisions? This one we can have a little bit easier because one, we know the product rule, and two, we know the chain rule. Using these two, we can get to this rule a lot easier. The idea is this. Instead of thinking of it, of it as f over g, Think of it as f times g to the negative 1 power. Think of it as a product. This is going to allow us to derive a rule. So the product rule says the derivative of such a thing will look like differentiate the first one, leave the second one alone, plus leave the first one and differentiate the second one. Now, you'll notice here you have an inside function and the negative one power is the outer function. We have to differentiate this part here with the chain rule. So I'm going to do the power rule first, differentiate around the g. So the negative one comes down, the inside is left intact, subtract one from the power. And then we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. That. Now this, let's just write it a little bit nicer, and let's just clean things up a little bit. I'm not going to write the of x because we already know. Okay, so this is f prime times g to the minus 1 minus f g prime times g to the minus 2. I can write these as fractions. This is f prime over g minus f g prime over g squared. I uh, can combine these by creating a common denominator, multiplying by g over g. So I end up with f prime g minus f g prime all over g squared. Now another name for division is quotient. So this rule tells us how to differentiate quotients. What are we going to call it? Quotient. This leads to the last rule of today. Quotient. It tells us how to differentiate a quotient. If I have one function divided by another function, well, the derivative of that is going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom square. And this is something we don't know.
applying all these rules, we will we are now able to differentiate every function that we will encounter in this entire course. So we're going to talk about differentiating other functions like tangent of x, etc. And we can just notice that, oh, I can write tangent as sine divided by cosine. And I know the derivatives of each of those. I can figure out what that is. Right? Any other function that we're going to come across, you'll realize that all the rules I told you today, we'll be able to apply those in order to find their derivatives. And that's going to be important. We'll do some more examples. We'll talk about some properties of derivatives next time. Remember, we don't have class on Tuesday. Okay, so the next time I'll see you guys is Wednesday. And we'll have a Tuesday. Okay, all right. See you guys. Have a good weekend.